Today I want to share with you the greatest statement of all time. But before I jump into the Bible and share with you what I think the greatest statement of all time is, I want to share with you a couple of statements uh, that came from movies that I think were pretty awesome. And uh, what I thought you could do today is if you want uh, at home, you could type in uh, on your computer maybe a great quote or a great statement that you love from a movie. And I want to share with you a couple of my favorites the first one is, is when Lloyd starts to come back to find Harry as Harry's walking home and they're kind of at the end of their despair. They're struggling with how they're going to get to Aspen. And here comes Lloyd on a moped and Harry asks the question, where'd you get that thing? And he says, I traded a kid back in town for, you know, the van straight up. He goes, I can get 60 miles to the gallon on this hog. And Harry looks at Lloyd and says, Lloyd... Just when I thought you couldn't possibly be any dumber, you go and do something like this and totally redeem yourself. Of course, Lloyd says, you still want to go to Aspen? Harry says, absolutely. And they jump on the bike and they start heading toward Aspen. One of the great cinematic moments in history. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> was a fun one. Another quote that I really love is, is a little more serious one, but it comes from the movie Shawshank Redemption. And you might remember it. It was when uh, Morgan Freeman, the character, basically said this question. He says, it, it comes to a really a simple choice. Get busy living or get busy dying. Great quote. Great statement. Pretty awesome. Another movie that I enjoy was the movie called Braveheart. And in the movie, there's this great statement, a great quote. He says, at one point in time, the William Wallace says to the king or uh, one of the leaders in, in, um, in that area at that time, he said, men don't follow titles, they follow courage. Or at the end of the movie, you could say the statement, freedom, could have been a great statement as well. And the best of all, if you're a Star Wars fan, was when Darth Vader looks at Luke and says, Luke, I am your father. I don't know if you've put anything online today, typed anything in as far as a statement, but there have been some great statements in movies. There have been getting some great statements and quotes in, in, the, in the history of our world, but there's never been one statement that I think has changed history and is the greatest statement of all time other than this statement. Before I share with you the greatest statement I believe in the history of the world, I want to share a little bit of background. Remember, we have God giving Abraham this nation, and that the nation was going to be a blessing to it, not only to Abraham, it was going to be a blessing to the world. And that, God, that Abraham, not having any children, Sarah not able to bear children at the time, God said to Abraham, you're going to have enough descendants that will outnumber the stars in the sky. And God provided a son, and, and he provided a nation, and that nation was Israel. And God s basically followed Israel throughout all of the Old Testament and even into today in a lot of ways. Now, the nation of Israel was going to be a blessing. And yet, even though the nation of Israel was going to be a blessing, it went through lots of hardship, and it went through a lot of times of oppression. And when Jesus enters the scene, many people, the Israelite people that knew the stories and knew the history of Israel, they asked a lot of questions. They're kind of like, well, well when, is, when is this Messiah going to come? Like they knew some of the, the, the history of, and the prophecy of the Old Testament. They knew Isaiah 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 6. You know, for, for a child is going to be born to us. A son is going to be given. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. I mean, they would have wanted that Messiah, that son, that child to come. And they, they didn't necessarily know when or how or, or what. And they might even question, like, will he ever come? Even like today, maybe we're saying, is Jesus going to come back soon? When is he going to come? I'm guaranteeing you he will come again. And it says in the scripture, it says, his government, the, that, that this son who's going to come, his government is going to be a, a government that has peace and it will rule forever and it will never end. 
In his rule, he'll rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David, the messianic covenant. I mean, we have so much great history and understanding these Israelite nation would have, and they're waiting for this Messiah to come. You know, a little bit later, it actually says in Scripture that the Messiah, this son, in Isaiah 53, verse 3 through 6, says this. And this is prophecy. This happened 1,500 or so years before Jesus showed up on this earth. It says, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. See, this person, the one that's prophesied about, he was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Isn't that true? And yet the Lord laid on him the sins, the selfishness of us all. He put it on Christ. And so now here, take this picture. Think about about all the statements that Jesus has made. Here he is. He goes to the cross. He has all the sin of the world on his shoulders. And he is across on that cross. His arms are spread across. And he looks out and he makes a statement. And the statement he makes is, It is finished. It is complete. It is accomplished. It is, in my sense, my belief, the greatest statement to have ever been made. Like God made a statement. The Father made a statement through the Son that said, it is finished. It is complete. It is done. It is won. God has done what he needed to do. Now there are four, I can see four implications from this statement that is amazing. Like, four th- implications that happen because of this statement. And so this is why it's the greatest statement ever. Here's the first one. All requirements are fulfilled. Everything that the Father wanted the Son to do, He did. You know, I can imagine a uh, honey, do, honey do list, right? Like, like your, your spouse or somebody creates a list and they, and they make like 10 things they want you to do on a weekend. And basically you're, you're scratching off one, you're scratching off two, you're scratching off three. You get to the end of it and you accomplish all that that person wanted you to accomplish. And at the end of that list, you can tear it up and you can say, it's done. It's finished. And you can walk over to that person and say, I did it. You see, the implication of when Jesus said, it is finished, he was saying that the father had requirements for his son. Like the father had expectations for him to do. And Jesus is in the garden before the night before that he was, the night, the same night he was betrayed and the night before he dies. He was in the garden pleading with God, saying, God, take, if, if there's any other way, father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. Let it pass. Like, but not my will, God, but yours be done. So when he died and he was on that cross, and right before he gave up his spirit, he said, it is finished, it is done, it is complete. He drank the cup the Father wanted him to finish. The cup of wrath, the cup of judgment, the, 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 to, to carry the sin of our lives. That's why this is, one of the, is the greatest statement of all time. Because when he says it is finished, you have to understand that the implication of that is that he did everything the Father required him to do. And because of that, there's more implications for us. Let's look at the next one. There's an implication that, the, that, 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 it was, that what he did was once for all time. Like all the priests for 1,500 years since Moses in the sacrificial system of worship. They would kill a a lamb. 
And the priest would, once a year at the Day of Atonement, would, would slaughter a perfect spotless lamb. And one priest would, would take the blood of the lamb into the holy of holy places in the temple that was created, in the tabernacle and later the temple. And they would go in there and what they would do is they would tie like a rope around the foot of the priest because if there was anything wrong and they die, they would pull them out. So they, they go into the Holy of Holies and they, they share this blood, this sacrifice for what? For the temporary, the, the moments leading in, that, in their life for the forgiveness of sin. In Hebrews it talks about this. It says, for without the shedding of blood... There's no forgiveness of sin. So animals were sacrificed for our sins. Now what makes this statement and this act of what Jesus did on the cross at that moment was once for all time, he became the spotless, sinless Lamb of God who was perfect and could bear our sins on the cross. And he died at that moment. When he said it is finished, the implication is, is that now there's no more need for any other sacrifice to be made. That your sins are forgiven for those that believe in Jesus Christ. That the sin of the world was taken upon him. The Bible says that as Adam, through Adam all sin entered, but it says through Christ salvation entered through one man. All sin entered through one man, God, Jesus. Salvation entered. And it was once for all time to tell us, die, it is finished. It's done. It's complete. And that happened when he said, it is finished. And then he died. There's another implication here that's just also just completely amazing. Is that our debt is paid in full. This is a business term. People use to telesty the, the Greek form of this, or the Greek word that we, that we know is, it is finished. It's a, it's a business term. That we all have a, a, a debt that we owe. You know, some of us have car payments. Some of us have school loans. I don't know how many of you still have a school loan out there that you're paying for. You have a house payment. You know, you have all these things that, that are, are debts that you owe. And at the moment that Christ went to that cross, we all owed a sin debt, and that sin debt was something that we had to pay for. And the only way we could pay for it is our own death. None of us wanted to die. So Jesus becomes our a substitutionary atonement. He, he becomes the one that takes our place at the cross, so that we don't have to die if we believe in him, that he would take on the sin of the world, that he would pay our debt in full. And so it's an amazing story. God says, you know, in, in Romans chapter uh, 5, verse 8, he says, God demonstrates his amazing love for us while we are still in debt, <laughs> while we were still sinners. He died for us. And the debt was paid in full. I don't know when you've ever paid off a loan or paid off something and you send that money in and you just go, oh, thank God it's all done. It's all finished. To tell us die. It's done. It's complete. It's accomplished. And that's what he did. He paid the greatest debt that we didn't want to pay. Christ paid it for us, and he said, it is finished. You see, those are the, some of the implications of that statement being the greatest unprecedented statement of all time. Here's the next one. Fourth implication is that we have new life and we're free from sin. We're free from sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, it says, For we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. 
You see, what happened was when God went to that cross and he said it was finished and he died at that moment, he gave us new life. We died with him so we could have new life. There's an implication here. The implication is, is that anytime something ends, there's a new beginning. Amen, right? That, that, that when the old life is gone, there's a new life that's going to come. And that is good news. And that statement, it is finished, means death has been you know, conquered and there's new victory and new life in Jesus. The Bible says those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the pa- their passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and has crucified them there. The Bible says that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are free to live in love for others. The statement, it is finished. When Jesus died on the cross and he said it is finished, he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was crushed for our peace. He was scourged for our healing. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat fall to the ground and die, it cannot come back to life. But what he did is he went into the ground. He died so that he could bring back life to us. The statement, it is finished, has power. And it has so much implications behind it to change our lives. It is the greatest story, the greatest act of all time, and the greatest statement that should bring hope to each one of us today. When Jesus died, there was a temple, the curtain ripped in two that, that now we didn't have to worship just inside of the holy place and bring sacrifices. That God, that his temple was ripped into. His presence was no longer in the temple. His presence now resides in the human heart. Not a temple made of stone, but it's temple of the human heart. What an amazing story. A few years ago, my grandma had... Um, Probably about a year ago, my grandma was going through a difficult time. And one of the things that um, when any grandmas that, that you know, are, are possibly on their deathbed, I mean, we, we didn't know, um, when that happens, you know, everybody seems to rush to their side. And so back then, um, a year ago or so, I remember seeing all my family showed up. All these people ran to grandma's side and when I got to sit down and talk with my grandma, I thought it was just, an, it was amazing what she said. She kept saying to me, I don't deserve love like this. Now, I, I kind of kept thinking, well, grandma, of course you do. I mean, look what you've done for this family. I mean, look at, you know, my mom and, and, and her sisters and, her, and my mom's brother. And, and look at all these different grandkids and great-grandkids and all the love and, and gifts and kindness and all the things that you've shown. Of course you deserve love like this. And she kept saying, I just don't feel like I deserve this much love. And I was listening to Lauren Daigle at that time, some of the songs, and she had sung this song, Love Like This, and it had the same message, so I decided I would just share with Grandma. So I grabbed my iPhone, I hit play, and I was letting my grandma listen to this song. And as we were listening to this song, I could see tears well up in her eyes, and she could say, absolutely. How can we, we don't deserve love like this? And, and there's something that happens when we, when we respond to, I don't deserve it, but I'm going to freely receive it. We just sing hallelujah. We just sing hallelujah. God is good. Thank you. We just receive it. And something happens when we receive God's love. It transforms our heart and it gives us opportunity to love. I want to share this song with you today. And so uh, join me in listening to this great song.
I love, that, I love the song, I cannot earn what, we, what you so freely give. That's, that's the, the idea that Grandma, I felt, was trying to get to me. Is She's like, I, I, I don't, I can't, there's nothing I can earn to ex- receive this amount of love. And I said, Grandma, that's the love of Jesus. And that's the love of Jesus through your family. And that love has the power to, to heal, <laughs> the power to restore, the power to, to bless and to give us life. And I got to tell you, my grandma's still doing really well today. And I keep telling her it's because of the love of Jesus and the love of her family. Now, just to share what happened after that, um, my, when my, I figured I should probably talk to my grandma a little bit before, um, before I left in case I never saw her again. And so I, I, I kind of stayed in the background until everybody else left the room. And I walked up to my grandma and, and she says, she says to me, she's like, Josh, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be with Jesus. And I said, Grandma, nobody wants you to go be with Jesus yet. I mean, we, we still want you to be with us. And she says, well, I, when I go, I want you to do my funeral. And I said, well, of course I'll do your fun- funeral, Grandma. I said, is there anything you want me to say? And she says, yeah. She says, I, I would want you to say that I'm proud of everybody and that we were so blessed. And I said, Grandma, I will make sure that I tell everybody those two things. And so I prayed with Grandma, and I walked out, and I saw my whole family gathered, and and they came around me, and they said, what did Grandma say? What did Grandma say? And I said, Grandma said that I am her favorite. (laughs) The story of my grandma reminds me of how much God loves me and how much I don't deserve his love. How has God's love impacted your life? Are you moved by it? Are you a new person? How does your life look now because you've experienced his love? I gotta be, I wanna be very encouraging to our church today. You know, Hope Fellowship, I am so proud to be your pastor, and I'm so proud of the things that you're doing. And I hope that you'll continue to be moved by God's love to do some amazing things. You know, just yesterday, it was my daughter's birthday, eighth birthday party, and um, we had a ton of people show up. And in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of quarantine and social distancing, what I loved was seeing you guys show up and take pictures six feet away, (laughs) you know, But it was so moving for my daughter and for my family to see the love that you have because God loves you and you chose to love us. When Jesus went to the cross and said, to tell us die, it is finished, he broke selfishness, he broke sin so that we could love. That's what he did. Now here's the last verse I want to share with you, a couple verses I want to share with you. He says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He showed us that love by going to the cross. It is finished. Dear friends, since God loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Church, to be practical, go out and love people. Continue to give food and meals to families in need. Continue to, to, to show up and pay a bill for somebody that needs it. Continue to, to go into the community and bring a smile to someone else's face. In those ways, people will know that there is a God because God lives in you. And, it's, and he is complete in you. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You want to do something amazing, go out and love people. And as you do, people will see who God is. And that happened because it is finished on the cross. Selfishness died. Sin was defeated. It's the greatest statement, unprecedented statement in all history. It is finished. Now we have an opportunity to have new life. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Father God, I thank you for this message. I pray that we would be motivated by your love, that we would understand that that we don't deserve it, but you freely give it anyway. 
And Father, because of that, I pray that we would be willing to freely give it to others and that this world would be so transformed by it is finished and by let's go and show people the love that you've given us to give. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.